uh, it's it's an international group with people from you know, Australia, and, uh, Europe, uh, and the US. And uh, uh, I summarized it with the uh, conversation with AI afterwards and asked it to make recommendations for the next session. And it's absolutely incredible how how structured that is, you know, and how how it uh, captures the essence of the conversation. But there is also a lot of stuff happening in healthcare because, I mean, I had uh, a checkup a couple of weeks ago and my uh, blood pressure registered at 150, which like shocked me, right? Yeah. And uh, I kid you not, three days later, I'm, I'm with Humana, which is a Disney sponsored uh, healthcare service. I got a letter saying that, uh, I did, um, I got a letter that they want to send me a blood monitor, blood pressure monitor, and enroll me in a program. And I got, you know, I got a blood pressure monitor and, and an app on my phone. Right. It gives me the instructions on, on when and how you know, to use this thing. And it's already sending me dietary recommendations and and all that stuff. So it's kind of preventative medicine. So, so they are using AI already big time you know, to to engage people, but that of course only addresses the AI, sort of illiterate part of the population, you know, that can follow this. It doesn't. There's a lot of people left out in the process. I also learned over beers in Portland that Klaus did a lot of yoga. I don't know if you're still doing yoga, but you did a whole bunch of yoga back in the day, to the point where he could hold a handstand for three minutes which is astonishing that's a very very i can't hold a handstand for 10 seconds but three minutes is a really long time to hang out there but those men my better years they they have passed you know? but my, my hat my hat's off to you that's a that's a really lovely accomplishment your better years are ahead of you still class that's right Thank you. <laughs> especially when you take down the food system and convert it all to regenerative and all that good stuff so um also wanted to say that uh, neobooks.org works and is a little baby fledgling site, but I haven't finished really writing the manifesto. If you'll see on the homepage, there's a little bit there and it points into uh, the wiki where I'm trying to explain neobooks. I still need to do more about uh, videos explaining the neobooks uh, concept. Uh, but if you'd like to help write a manifesto or rewrite it or something like that, uh, sounds great. I'm actually trying to write it as a human, not ask uh, AI to come up with the manifesto because I, I tried a couple things. I tried feeding it our old transcript and I got something that felt too generic and not sort of specific and and, and focused enough for what I think we're trying to do. So um, all suggestions welcome. Um, and then I, I mentioned to Klaus that I've just redone my website entirely and I'm doing a very soft launch this week. Uh, if anybody wants to take a look at it and then, you know, any, any and all comments and fixes for what's broken. Cause I already noticed a couple of things this morning that aren't working. Um, I would really appreciate it because I'm doing that also. That's, that's like my main priority these days. Um, so I, I did. Manifesto. Pardon? Go ahead, Klaus. So I, I, after our conversation, Jerry, when we when we met in in Portland, um, I ran this questions through the GPT. Uh, I mean, to the one that I had programmed here. Um, you now, what is a neo book project? And also, um, you know, coincidentally, I I had a conversation with someone on LinkedIn who uh, about this article I just published on LinkedIn, my latest newsletter. And he, he's saying, well, I mean, this thing basically regurgitates what you put in. There's really no AI involved here. And I, so I shared with him this question here that I asked to, to my AI, summarize the sources you're using to respond to specific questions. And actually, this AI, which popped up you now just out of a conversation on our email thread, um, and, and and which I used for my latest newsletter, uh, I just programmed it with a collation of neo books. Um, you know the story of soil, which we you know, did together. The science of survival, the thoughts about food, uh, and and uh, 
Uh, and so, so it's like you can program this in five minutes because if you have these neo books set up, they in turn uh, collation of thought of thoughts. You know, uh, we call them nuggets, uh, which then can pull together. And I like story of soil has uh, spiral dynamics in it. It has an introduction to theory U. Um, so it's you know it's it's super easy to to instruct an AI. Uh, to to frame uh, a thought process, so to speak. I mean, it, to frame how you want it to, quote unquote, think you know, about the questions you're putting in. So, I mean, to me, I mean, I've used from the from the get go. I've used this neo book process as a training tool for the AI. Very cool. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else with thoughts? Yeah, go ahead, Pete. Uh, I was going to say that um, I working on the manifesto might be a great a great project for this crew um, or the NeoBooks crew, like over time or something. I don't know. Um, so it looks like it's it's started, but not not very uh, not very formed yet. Yeah, yeah. If, if I may. Um, I I'm also. Go ahead. Oops, you've just. Sorry, made this is a uh, super tactical thing, but let me. There's a there's a there's a hypertext thing that that like popped up for me, um, uh, and not not seeing not saying that there's a right or a wrong, <laughs> um, but this is a, a classic thing that that always bugs me uh, with hypertext. Um, uh, the link here, I think, should be introduction in neo books because that puts the you know, it puts the concept in the list of concepts that are linked to. Um, but this is a, a really common way to do it, um, uh, just as a as a pointer. But then there's no uh, semantic information. This, I I I I don't mean to highlight it, and it's not like the biggest part of of anything. But um, but this is a really good example. Usually, the the examples I see aren't aren't so clear. You know, click click here is the the classic phrase, right? So so um, yeah. Pete, you're, and, I, I, go ahead. And often the hypertext thing is kind of clunky or it's it, it it's not quite, this one is really obvious. It's like that should be the link. It, often you have to rewrite the sentence to get a, a nice clean link out of it. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, a, thanks for pointing that out. B, I think weirdly, I'm increasingly guilty of this, even though I agree with you. And I think what happened to me was it, it came out of writing emails because I'm just reflecting on it. And, and I love linky text, just love linky text. And I think I found that when I embedded the link properly, like with the context, people just didn't know it was a link, didn't click on it, yeah. missed, the, missed the point entirely. So I wound up saying, there's a link over here. And that yeah. has crept into my writing style now in, in a way that you just pointed out. So you're, you're completely right. And I'd love to hear other people's thoughts about I, it's it's not I I y y your your instinct to do it this way was completely right too I think there's there's a there's a clunkiness with uh, linked text that is that that we've never gotten over the hump of really um, to to read and write linked text is a little bit of a you know it's it, it's not quite English um, and you have to get used to it and you have to know oh I get I know why he linked that because I'm going to get to a page that says introduction to neo books right and then like the whole structure fits together but I think most people don't think in hypertext hyper you know hyper websites or whatever um, so I it's a it's a shortcut that I think accommodates more readers uh, better so there you go I, I would also love to hear what other people. Yeah, are. me too. Anyone else with strong feelings about this? Apparently not. No, I, I, I absolutely agree with Pete. Uh, it's um, it it makes a lot of sense semantically to to do that. And now I I, I do the same thing, uh, the same type of mistake as well. But um, I do think it's a good practice to correct. I um, thanks thanks for that, Jose. I I hypothesize that uh, that most people. I I don't know. I don't know if it was. It would be a little bit of education. You know, hey, look, this is a website where we've linked a lot of concepts together, and you can think of it as, you know, as a 
um, well, the the even the visualizations we have, we have ball and stick visualizations of of a of a graph, you know, either two D graph or a three D graph, and that ball and stick visualization is is really a poor way to do hyper hypertext. But anyway, I I think. I think we don't have enough people that we've trained how hypertext works. And I'm not even sure it's a matter of training. I, I wonder if it's, uh, I, 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 the, the wiki people I know think in, in, in graph structures, right? I'm not sure that everybody does. And if you want maybe... to, if you want to refresh the homepage of the site, you'll see it's been changed. Thanks. Elves, elves got busy right away. Uh, thanks Dave, you're, you're up there. So I know I was just dicking around with the raise hand button, huh. trying to figure out how to paste it to my what my uh, so ignore me. <laughs> All right. Any other thoughts on the rhetoric or semantics of no. of linky linky text? I I think it's subjectively worse uh, with the the fix. I think it's more technically correct uh -huh. and harder for most people to read or hard, harder for most people to uh, engage with. So, so that's my conundrum right there. Yeah. Um, I, you know, the, this is, this is clearly technically correct. I'm not sure that it's uh, correct in a UX sense. Yeah. Um, I, I love well-written wikis, like, like when you can just sort of, when you're in with the, hey, links matter, and we've been careful and cautious about which links we add and how we add them and 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 do them as elegantly and as sparingly as you can and not overdo them and blah, blah, blah. It's really a pleasure. It's, uh, it feels like an old hypercard, one of the really good hypercard stacks I... um, or, or mist or something like that. The the uh, I, I think maybe what happens to reflect on it some more and, and thanks for y'all's forbearance, the um, folding the, I think links would be better as buttons. Folding a link into the into the English is it's it's a really interesting collapse of functionality, but I'm not sure that it's it's practical. In, I think in of reality. it as practic practical dual use, but. I see. I see where you're heading. I just don't know how buttons make this better, nicer. I, you know, I older. as as somebody who loves to to read stuff off of off of a page. It could be a paper page or a you know a screen or uh, an e ink page, ideally. Um, uh, the the underlying things are interruptive. They they interrupt my enjoyment of a beautiful text, right? Um, uh, if I were in Mickey, wiki mode, if I were in wiki mode, I would I would want lots of links. Um, but if I'm just reading, the links are interruptive in a way that, um, uh, like callouts uh, in the margin or something like that. And if the callouts were buttons, that would be a better a better presentation. It would be more obvious that there there are buttony linky things and less interruptive of the the reading flow of the text. This is also, say I, also Go ahead. I respond more to hyperlinks that are that are identified separately than embedded in the text. I mean I have to actually really remind me I should really click on this, you know, when I read through a text. And I hate naked links. Just can't stand seeing naked links in well, text. they shouldn't be naked links. Yeah. They should look more like footnotes. They should be like a, a, a word or even a number or something like that. And they should be a button. Right. But like numbers next to the text have never pleased me. And looking down at the end of the page or the end of the chapter, that has always irked me. And hypertext yeah, with this really. nice, nice collapsing of that and more because because foot, you know, hypertexts have more functionality than footnoting. Um, uh, so so what I'd like to call for is an exploration into this a little bit more. Um, uh, and I think when we present linky text, which I think is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a big compromise, I think, but it's a reasonable, you know, reasonable way to do it kind of the, the least, one of the least objectionable because it's most compact it's least. So if we're doing that, I think we need to help people. We need, we need to say, 
you know, there ought to be a new book. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I, I say there ought to be a new book about um, hypertext and reading links and stuff like that. Um, and, it, you know, if I had my druthers, uh, I would have a toggle on, on every hypertext page uh, that, that went from the standard HTML way to do it to something else. Um, uh, buttons in the gutter or footnote buttons or, or something. Buttons in the gutter is sort of almost alliterative, but not quite, but kind of poetic. Um, <laughs> and, and also you're coming right back into the things we've talked about before, which is how does a nugget, for example, have different instantiations or make itself available in different ways at different grade levels of reading? You know, here, here's the thought, um, uh, people are more trustworthy than we think they are. Here is text around it at different levels in different languages with as a video, as whatever, as a PowerPoint slide. Hey, look, here it is in, an all, in a dancing version. And one of those variants should be, here it is adapted to the reader's preference. I, and and uh, uh, digging in a little bit more, I, I can see. So I, I can see one view that looks mostly like English without, you know, interruptive links, but button somewhere. Another view is straight HTML, uh, the way it's the way we classically write it now. Another way would be really cool, uh, a new book way would be I can read this page and I can also see at least a snippet or something of the linked pages. So instead of a, a single page with lots of links out that are kind of opaque and you know I, I don't know what's there until I go there and then I'm in a whole new, different page and I've lost my train of thought. If you could have it set up so the the pages kind of like uh, are small and get big, or you know you can see a little summary of them, or you know, and so the whole page is a composite page of not just this page, but um, all its uh, first order links or something too. It's kind of almost sort of like Talmudic commentaries, but not really. Yeah, yeah, um, actually, but, it, a little bit more interactive than that, but yeah, yeah exactly, yeah, and. I mean, and you know, and then you focus, and and some mix of uh, federated wiki or something too, right? Um, you focus on one of the pages, and it gets big, but the other one doesn't completely go away. It's it's still behind you, right? So you can you can kind of flip in and out of the the various pages that are all linked together as a as an information space, not just a flat uh, copy of a paper with you know lots of markup. Mm -hmm. See, I, I also think that it depends on, on what your intentions are with embedding links. So, for example, if I make statements that someone may want to verify, I embed it in the text. Right? I make this statement. You can either believe it. If you don't want to believe it, I have put the backup into the text. But if I want you to read something, right? if I want to point out you need to read this, then I put it in as a separate with a button. And I typically, I put in the title of the article and then and then hyperlink it. Um, that's a really that's, good observation, class. And that's something we're actually wrestling with in NeoBooks in the sense, a simple sense of how um, Obsidian and Pete's web builder handle transclusion, which means if you just put a, a link in in Markdown, it's just a link and it shows up however you, you marked up the link. But if you put a, uh, an exclamation point in front of it, it actually pulls that text in and, and, and makes it part of the page that you're, that you're reading. That's, it transcludes it in. Um, and that, that's a piece of what you're saying, Klaus, where, where the smaller idea could still be a separate nugget, but it gets imported and becomes part of the flow of the larger nugget. And that's, in fact, how nuggets roll up into blocks of ideas, into chapters, into books. Is, is sort of through uh, nested transclusions in some sense. Um, separate thought, and I think you guys have heard me say this, or maybe more on Free Jerry's Brain. One of the things I adore about using the brain is that it lets me see vicinity and context even more than content. Uh, and so the thing that Pete just said would be nice about a text, what if you could see glimmers of or telescoping text or whatever, um, is one of the things I love about the brain is that I'm, I'm always seeing more context than anything. Exactly. And the context is king for me. Like the context really, like I, I, my brain thinks that way. I love, you know, it just, it just is a great match. So if I, if I may um, shift a little bit, another thing in, in, in this website, uh, what I, what I was uh, thinking is. You're, you're breaking up on a box, or maybe it's me. Um, 
It could be me, my internet, uh, my, my, I, I'm on mobile because my local internet crashed. It's, it's gone. I it, mean, you're, you're smooth now. Keep, keep going. You're good. Um, so, so can we use the same website also to create uh, some kind of a membership um, uh, section? Now, now you are breaking up. You may want to turn off your, turn off your video. Okay. Pause um, to, yeah, exactly. That should help. You'll be fine. Okay. So, so to use this new book, you know, as, as an entry into different new books, um, and so to provide a uh, section to to different new book writers uh, who then can uh, elaborate on this on their specialty on their topics um, and, and put in an AI to be to be interactive. Uh, this could be a membership based uh, uh, section there, and uh, for you know, for OGM uh, to to you know, make make a public service available there. In that sense, because we have have we have we have several writers right, who have content, um, and so this could be, in my mind, it could be uh, a product that we can create here. Uh, can you say a little more how you envision that? You mean you mean that somebody would sign in to our website and there would be a membership part of it to do what things? So to access to access various neo books. Um, you could have multiple topics. I mean, uh, you know, Peter's topics, Dave. Uh, you know, I mean, I think everyone has uh, uh, topics that are that are quite unique uh, in content. So, kind of pay paywalled versus not paywalled content for Neobus. Yeah, yeah, and and it would be you know revenue for OGM or you know for for whichever way you want to handle it. I mean, I don't care about it, but. Uh, it, I mean, obviously, it would be helpful to have a revenue source to pay for some of the development that's being done here, um, and and so um, uh, and 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 attract more people to to the project uh, to to share their um, their new book ideas. Anyone else have thoughts? Um, I like where Klaus is going with it. <clears throat> I've got um, uh, I've got a project I'm working on, um, which is meant to mentor people, help help uh, mentors and mentees find each other and work together, um, learning about AI. I, I think um, uh, and and it's got a paywall. Uh, I think a, a way to think of um, content. Uh, the, I think in, in the new age, content is the old way to think of stuff and interactive learning is the new way to think of stuff. Uh, interactive learning with uh, mentors. Um, so so I, I, so I guess I would pitch for Neobooks. Um, uh, I like the idea of a membership, uh, um, you know, membership thing. And that would be a way not to consume content but rather to interact with the community around learning about the con you know what you know learning about the topics that are covered by content it does make me think of something pete and i'll just sorry i was going to jump but uh you know i just sat uh brad de graf presented some of the stuff he's doing with his social graph work if you did you dip in any of that so down. Brad's kind mm -hmm. of doing a Kumu look like thing for uh, to try to support community groups and provide infrastructure for community groups. Yep. And um, and I one of the things I like is he's doing this green check thing where people verify each other. Um, so I think we'll have some more conversations around whether or not to somehow get GRC as one of the communities into this system and what that would look like. Um, yeah, exactly. And uh it just makes me think that there might be kind of a verified community aspect to neobooks that's a value, right? Because the nuggets, I think, then, you know, have another layer of meaning in some sense. Mm -hmm. um, you're taken from their authors and stuff. But anyway, it just struck me that it, there is an overlap in there. And yeah, the thanks, more Dave. we can, the more we can use infrastructure that other people are building out that needs more people using it, the better, especially if it gives us features we want and, uh, 
takes away code we might have to write otherwise. Yeah, well, it kind of, I think, starts to tackle some of the disinformation issue. You know, you at least you can untangle where the information came from, and there's a clarity there. Yeah, there's something about having positive idea around people, and and that should reduce disinformation and misinformation. Then there's a whole bunch of complexities to it, clearly. Um, anyway, I, I'm I'm wishing social media companies had been more clever and more aggressive about all the disinformation that's floating around. One of my wish list items a while ago when all this shit started hitting the fan was that Twitter would offer a special feature that would um, light up your your feed to show you how many things that you wrote or retweeted are actually known misinformation. Well, they did charge you 10 bucks to say you're anybody. So <laughs> it's almost the same. Yeah, almost. They've, they've got their reader contributed um, Thanks, Dave. fact check things now, gotta which, go. See which you are guys. actually useful. Um, while we're while we're on the uh, topic of um, Brad's now thing, which I never realized before, it's it's uh, like DAO but with uh, N instead of yeah, a D. it's network um, autonomous organizations. Yeah. Uh, let me share as something else uh, called Git for Gov, um, and uh, Git for Gov. Uh, which is a, uh, it's kind of a blockchain. <clears throat> it's it's like a DAO management, DAO infrastructure, but it runs uh, runs on much more commodity uh, commodity infrastructure, uh, including Git. Um, I think yeah, I got one link. link. I need I, I need the the uh, let's see. Here's the white the white paper link. Um, dang it, get for. Uh, there's another link to, and it's gov forget, not get for gov. There you go. That's why I'm. Yeah, that's why it's not showing up for you. It's gov forget. Gov forget. Yeah. Um. And then their new URL is get rules. Oh. Dot AI. Uh, and there they've got a. <laughs> their their links are tangled, which is why I'm tangled. Um, so they've also got a thing called uh, Waimea. Do you know who's involved in Git rules? Uh, I don't know them. Um, I heard about this from uh, David Bovel. Uh, he's looking at at uh, he's this is one of like five um, kind of decentralized governance things that he's looking at. Uh huh. Very cool. Why mayor is what? Uh, I think it might be the evolved version of I go forget. Hmm. It's it's one of the features of the go for go forget platform. I guess go forget is kind of like a platform, and uh, why mayor is more like uh, an application on top of the hmm. platform. Not very, not very high up, um, but mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's got it kind of works with a block. It, it, they call it a blockchain. I think it is a blockchain, but the blockchain and the identity run on Git. <laughs> so uh, it the the white paper is interesting because um, because they talk about. Um, the infrastructural, the infrastructure needed to run your, you know, your governance backbone, um, they've reduced it a lot. So instead of depending on either massive 
uh, blockchain databases that and, and GPU you know level uh, computing um, uh, or things that necessitate um, cloud giants I think they call them <clears throat> um, the gov forget stuff <clears throat> uh, works you know works on <clears throat> commodity decentralized stuff really well so so um, is Waimea taking you know how there's a map on git uh, on github at least of what you know how many uh, how many times you pushed files to your repo blah 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 is it basically using information like that which is native to git to figure out how to compensate participants in our community but... yeah i there's there's a um there's stuff on a, a lot of the collaboration stuff on github is github specific so they're actually not relying on github um even though that's kind of where they're bootstrapping off of mm -hmm. um uh so there there are um i guess uh why may i use this prs uh, pull requests and pull requests are kind of a github thing um but you don't need github to to you know it, it was the idea was popularized um made huge by github but it you can just do it with straight up git so it's interesting yeah oh. Any other thoughts along these tracks from anybody? All right, then. Um, how shall we work on the, the manifesto? Um, shall I drop it in a Google Doc and we can go at it? I mean, I'm trying to figure out, this may be just me. I, be, I, I really believe in economy of words. I, I'm trying to figure out what are the fewest words we can write a manifesto in, not, not a five-pager, but something like, damned, damned, crisp and short that doesn't say anything obvious that is in, sort of interesting at every paragraph. That, that's, where I, that's where I'm hopefully aiming, which is why I got stuck, is that when I hold myself to a, like, a, like a really high standard of, of writing, which is what I'm trying to describe, um, it makes it hard to write. Um, but, I, but, I, but I don't want us to have like a, a lengthy, oh yeah, everybody's sort of saying that kind of manifesto. I'd like it to be pithy and crisp. Um, if I may, can I give a a quick tour of the Agile Manifesto, which I think is a well-done manifesto. Please. Um, uh, and by which, uh, well, well done, I mean structurally well done. Um, uh, the content itself, uh, let me share just, um, let me do, redo that share. I'll share just the, the mm -hmm. one. Um, uh, I've come back to this, and, and the, the structure of it, I think, is really nice. So the actual manifesto is is more um, contained in the uh, 12 principles. Mm -hmm. um, but as you can see, the 12 principles are something that you actually have to scroll through. It's not a, a single page thing. Um, so on the home page, um, they have uh, the kind of the patterns to to work work with, right? Um, and there's a, a cleverness with which they've said, uh, this isn't the thing it has to be, but you know, given one thing or another thing, we like individuals interactions, given another one thing or another thing, we like working software. Mm -hmm. um, so even the, uh, so they've collapsed those 12 principles down to these, these four mm. short statements. And in the short, the four short statements, they've made one of them much more uh, obvious. Mm -hmm. So you can start by just reading this manifesto for agile software development, individuals, interactions, working software, customer collaboration, responding to change. So right there, they've captured the, the core of it, right? And then hierarchically, you can expand out and you say, uh, you know, how do these things compare with the status quo? Um, and then uh, I like the, the preamble and the postamble here um how to read this uh you know what what our mission is um i i really value the names here um mm -hmm. it's unfortunate that they're all um old white men at this point yep um but i also appreciate the fuzzy background uh, this is an actual photograph just fuzzed up um it it grounds it in um in physical space and human connection um uh, and it's elegant. The whole thing is, is crisp and elegant. I like that. Yeah. And then I, I really appreciate the, you know, the, the, like the, the folks who were there at the founding of the constitution kind of, 
Um, uh, but then I also like the fact that they've got the ability to um, uh, support signatories um, and comments about that. Wow. And the way that unfolds is, is nice, I think. Um, and uh, the other thing I really, really like is that they've got a ton of languages here. Um, uh, I think that's like critical too. And uh, I, I even appreciate that the, um, the languages are listed uh, in, uh, you know, in their native uh, language, rather mm -hmm. than English and their native language. So. They've got Gallego? Damn. <laughs> they want to Gallego? Yeah. <clears throat> From Galicia. Nice. Cool. Um, thanks, Pete. That, that, that's sort of the Christmas Christmas I would love to see. So, so yeah. Uh, um, and I don't think. Um, I'm gonna step I, away from my camera, but I'll be listening and, and talking. Okay. I don't think I created a Google Docs for it yet, but shall I create a Google Docs and give it? Let us give this a try. I'll copy in the, the text I've got so far. But uh, yes, no, maybe. Yes. Okay, good. That's three thumbs up. That's enough for me. I'd add, um, I too like uh, the Agile Manifesto. I liked it more when it first came out. I think it's showing its age um, in some ways, both in presentation and styling. Mm -hmm. Um. I think it generally is not what you saw back then. So it stood out as something unique because it was it, it it was a manifesto that had as few words as possible, which makes sense from coders, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Um and and I think that that still works. I just don't know that 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 um that tone, that feel is, is, uh, has, uh, stood the, the test of time as much. Um, so I think there's a, a way to maybe do that in a more contemporary way mm -hmm. and still keep it as, uh, as brief as they did. Um, um, if, if I may, the thing that I appreciate, uh, at this day and age is the structure they've got there which unfolds from small to big. Which is what I think really holds the test of time. I agree, it, yep. It, yeah, that, that I think works really well. And, and, that... and, and I think we would do well to you know, do something, it doesn't have to be the same, but the ability to have a, a small front and a large back, I think is really important. Well, some people like big backs, you know. <laughs> And some people like small friends. <laughs> you know, there's a uh, government for Git here. There is something to be said for applying this to AI as well. Because the, the big challenge is that um, unless you know who, co who programmed or who trained this AI and how it is being uh, framed, what kind of guardrails it has, um, you can't really you can't really trust necessarily what, what comes out of it. So, so you, um, so I'm, I'm using very specific uh, contexts, you know, to establish guardrails for for any uh, GPT that I'm programming, um, and and I'm I'm starting to work with a, with a group uh, in the Palouse who, and they have a tech company that engages in AI, and they asked me to to, to work with them, and uh, so my, my my first thing would be that whatever we publish in terms of a GPT to be used by you know, the people we're working with, it has to have credibility. You know, it, you, you have to be able to trust it. And so that would be, um, I think that would be uh, a, an important protocol to incorporate into AI. So here's the, here's the Google Doc. Thanks, Trey. And 
Yeah, th this has a couple things. Like when I when I link in the first bullet to the creator's dilemma, um, that is actually a video that I did years ago, which basically says, "Hey, uh, creators face this weird dilemma." And I, I didn't make a link of this yet. I, I, I'll add that in as I perfect this little piece. But um, I did a video that says, "Hey, creators face this dilemma." On the one hand, most creators, I think, want their ideas to be seen by and used by the most people possible on the planet who, who's, who would be positively influenced by those ideas. Great. On the other hand, most people writing want to make a living from the thing they created. And those two things are in a complete opposite uh, dilemma. They, they, they create a, a dilemma for all creators. Uh, and open source people are like, I'm going to give up on the writing or try to get, I mean, give up on the compensation or try to get paid some other way because I think that <clears throat> the propagation and, and availability of the idea trumps making money from it. And that's kind of the camp I'm in. It's like, hey, if you like my writing, join me on Patreon or send me a tip or something like that. But I, I hate paywalls and velvet ropes and <clears throat> all those kinds of things. I just really want ideas to be out in the world working. And I realize that that's just where I fall on that spectrum. And there's plenty of people on that spectrum in lots of different places, um, including there's a little bit of content for free. And then there's other stuff that's special that's paid, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I was trying to encode that in the manifesto I was writing by pointing to a video that you could, you know, go watch and, and learn, wait, what do you mean creator's dilemma? Oh, this thing. So it would kind of unpack into a series of insights about why do nuggets matter and why are we even talking about this? Um, and I, I was, I, I ended up critiquing old media a bunch and new media uh, because I feel like it's those failings that that give us an opportunity to do something better. But I would love a manifesto that was mostly all positive. So that's why it's like imagine imagine lively documents. But but I find often that removing the critiques and going all very positive tends to make writing too vanilla somehow. Like it it ends up not being as compelling as oh crap I didn't realize that critique and you've got a solution is is different for me from. Oh, that's a nice idea, but it sounds a little Pollyanna. Does that make sense what I just said? I, I'm hitting this a lot as I write things. It's like, I think the critiques are often really important to understand the benefits of the positive action, but the critiques make the writing more negative by a lot. Um, I, I might, if, if I'm not careful, my natural writing style is is kind of wholesome i i remember somebody called it once uh something like wholesome circular platitudes um oh uh, my god really yeah <laughs> <laughs> um it, it it seems like friend, very friendly market marketing ease rather than <laughs> um you know in, insights of writing uh. so i i kind of well there's a, a fine line there but... uh-huh <laughs> Wholesome circular platitudes doesn't sound, make it sound like such a fine line. <laughs> <laughs> it 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 uh, it stung. That's very funny. I'm sorry. Um, it's like that's like shiny object syndrome. I'm like, ow, yes, I've got that in space. Yeah. 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 Um, one of the things that I think I'm being more recently uh, bombarded with, which is something that I don't do because it's difficult for me is uh, just focus on the future rather than focusing on the past. And telling the story of what, what we could have rather than telling the story of what we don't have. Right. Um, and all the limitations and all of the things that, that are broken and prevent us from doing it, and blah, 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 tends to be okay. how I tend to deal with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but I've had uh, friends and colleagues um, who are really thinking out of the box and going, you know, just just show people what it is that they could have. They already sense what's broken and they'll have an answer for what's broken. Um, and that sense of what's broken um, has has a intuitive sort of I'm looking for an answer for this thing and I don't know what the answer is. Oh, wow, here's an answer for this intuitive thing that I've had all along. I may not have ever expressed it verbally. 
So words aren't going to necessarily match it. Mm -hmm. But an answer will be intuitively understood as, as being an answer to that thing that's that's remaining. So I don't know how to do that very well. I've been trying to do it more as of late. Um, but it seems to me that if there is something that should have that kind of way of doing it, it should be neo books. Good point. You're giving um, me a good idea. I think I'll I'll take a swing at something that sounds like what I think you're saying. After yeah. later. I I uh, thanks, Jose. That's really smart. I uh, and and I'm reminded, but when classic context that that felt like it meant a lot to me. I'd so. There's, I think one of the tricks, and maybe Neobooks is a good answer to this, is trying to get the right, the right writing and the right structure and the right facts for a given context. Um, if if and if you've if you've got a static way to present your information, you need to aim at a particular context, and you can't be adaptive to context. Um, so. Uh, talking about uh, instead of fixating on the past, talking about a an attractive future or a future that could be possible or something like that makes a lot of sense. Um, and and if you only have one context, I think that's the right thing to do. If you can afford multiple contexts or multiple presentations, um, uh, at least some of the engineering folks, some of the systems thinking folks, um, failure analysis is a really good way to learn, right? Um, uh, if, if it doesn't take over the mainstream presentation of what you're trying to say that the world should be a better place, um, saying, well, here's a way the world, the current world broke, or here's the way the world broke 500 years ago. Let's do a failure analysis and understand what led up to that. And then instead of like stumbling towards the future without knowing what went wrong in the past, you can say, Hey, by the way, did you know, if you set up the system this way, you'll avoid the problem that we, you know, that we that we saw in this last plane, plane crash, right? So there's, I think there's a place for failure analysis and a place for what could be perceived as pessimism, uh, if it's, you know, structurally aligned towards making things better. And then you want to make sure that that's clear. The distinction is clear. Hey, I'm not being pessimistic. You know, the the plane fell out of the air, but that doesn't mean that you know I'm fixating on that because I like planes falling out of there or that we want the next one to follow there. I want to understand what happened so that we can do a couple chimp tab things, you know, going into the future so all the planes won't fall. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, to, to what Jose was just saying, you know, wanting to be forward-looking. Forward-looking means that you have to start from a place, and the place is is uh, uh, current, right? I mean, it's the it's the as is reality, that's your starting point. Uh, so then you look forward, but in order to look forward, you have to start looking backward. And my interpretation of looking backward is pattern recognition. You know, there are patterns in our evolution. Um, you know, the dawn of everything. Uh, you will Harari. You know, it, it illuminated uh, basically patterns that have been uh, repetitive based on human nature, you know, the, the, the character of our, of our species. So we got to this point very um, most of the time because there are inherent patterns in, in the way we structure our societies, our lives and all of that. And then from there, you look forward. So, so if you center yourself in the moment of now, you know, and you look forward with an understanding of where we came from, does that does that make sense? Because I, I mean, when you when you look at where we are today, we have been there dozens of times, right? Throughout the, the human evolution, uh, I mean, the technology is different. That you didn't drive cars two thousand years ago, but everything else really. Uh, uh, the the basic mechanics of of uh, civilization and living together and community and all of this haven't really changed, you know? and and so when we take that all of that in mind, we look at the moment of now. There there are points throughout our history where we have been in the same spot, you know? and then so going forward, you can leverage 
you know, the the under the evolutionary understanding of where we have been, uh, and and what are the options moving forward? And I, I just to be clear, that's the way I work. That's the way I think. That's what I do. Um, and and I think there's value in that in the creative process, and there's value in that in the explanatory process. What I'm learning. It's not too valuable when it's the engagement process, because the engagement process get that all of that gets lost, and and confuses the issue of what is this about? What am I getting if I get engaged in this? And right. that that thing, short, sweet understanding of what I will get, is more powerful than this lengthy story of how we got here, why we're here, and so on and so forth, which, again, <laughs> as guilty as the next guy of that. Um, but I think, to Pete's point, that can be there in the back, right? For people who go, Bush, yeah, tell me how, right? And then poof, yeah, let me, let me look at the how. But it's not what's at the front. It's not what... Um, yeah is trying to capture me. Exactly. This is why I like to work with spiral dynamics because you're translating the the the, the story that of in, in your awareness into a world view that lives within a different context. And right? so realities are different in each world view. And you have to transfer the information that you're that you're wanting to embed into the world view you're communicating with. Uh, and so, for example, when you're talking with a, with a worldview of blue, which is you know, the, the world of religion and belief in higher powers and magic and, and, and miracles and so on. So how, how does that play in that worldview? Um, now, conversely, you, you have uh, uh, orange where, you know, the, the, so, so anyway, not to get too deep into the weeds here, but that's why I like this and the other part that I'm really embracing is theory U because theory U is a, an iterative process, you know, of, of uh, engaging a, a conversation through steps of discovery and, uh, and, and building up on, 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 on an insight that allows a stage of presencing, which again is a different process in each worldview. One of the annoying nuances of looking ahead is that often the catastrophic future that current trends predict is the thing you're trying to avoid. And so I, I guess what you wind up doing is painting an optimistic scenario for how that got avoided or, or a better future was possible after all or something like that. But, but looking ahead isn't, isn't always a positive thing. Alas. Um. Alas, uh, I apologize. I, I need to leave in a minute. And um, Jay, thanks for posting the manifesto. Uh, I would like to see a section there, which is, you know, here's what we believe, um, or a credo. Principles we, yeah. Um, so I, I, uh, uh, I we could have Rick. You. We could have Rick set it to music even. <laughs> yes, uh, I applaud you starting with prose. Uh, but I, I think another good starting place is, you know, what, what are our core core beliefs. So I, I recommend we riff on this a couple different ways. Let's not try to craft one document here. Let's let's leave intact different people's uh, uh, attempts. And let's just go in and do a, a bunch of different things and see what we like uh, next week. Um, I think that'll work out really well. Let's, let's leave the diversity in the document. Don't try to edit it down, but right. rather let, yeah, let's, let's throw, in, throw in ideas and, in, and throw in meta commentary like, hey, we need a section that does something like Pete just said. Um, that'd be great. I love it. And um, I'm actually, I, I should probably actually go back to real real world as, as well, unless everybody thinks that we have things to cover for the next half hour. But can I'm you gonna... maybe, can you maybe uh, ping us with a document that where you would like uh, to, to consolidate uh, everyone's input? I think that's what you just shared, right? Yeah. So, so the document that, uh, the Google Doc that I put in the chat is the document to go to. I will also post it to our Mattermost link. Uh, to our Mattermost uh, channel. So, so it's there as well. Okay. Cool.
Cool. Thank Thanks you. All. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. There's guys.